It was the fist bump seen around the world. Joe Biden's greeting of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman during his Middle East trip last week. A fist bump with a man just about everyone, including our own government, believes ordered the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. A fist bump with the same man, then-candidate Biden, said this about back in 2019. Khashoggi was, in fact, murdered and dismembered, and I believe in the order of the Crown Prince. And I would make it very clear, we were not going to, in fact, sell more weapons to them. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. When the president was called on the apparent change of mind, Biden defended his handling of the meeting, saying he didn't mince words behind closed doors. With respect to the murder of Khashoggi, I raised it at the top of the meeting, making it clear what I thought of it at the time and what I think of it now. He basically said that he, uh, he, he was not personally responsible for it. I, I indicated I thought he was. But the picture that Saudi officials have painted since indicate Biden may not have been quite so direct. Biden's response? The Saudi foreign minister says he didn't hear you accuse the crown prince of the Soviet murder. Is he telling the truth? No. Many Mideast observers think other things do matter and that it is nothing new for a U.S. leader to do business with another human rights violating leader when other critical interests are at stake. Not pretty, but necessary, they argue. I'm joined by Karen Atiyah. She's an opinion columnist for The Washington Post. She was a friend of Jamal Khashoggi's. And Jothi Thoughtham editorials editor for the New York Times. Welcome to both of you. I really appreciate your time. Nice to be here. Karen, you, you wrote it was a, quote, crass betrayal of a campaign promise to the American people. Even if can, uh, candidate Biden hadn't made that pariah comment, you would not be on board with a Biden crown prince meeting, correct? I think, I think the, the real, you know, the real, like, main kind of question of, of all of this, right, is is uh, the disconnect, obviously, of the, the campaign promise and, you know, the sort of real politique of, of all of this. Um, oh, look, you know, of course, I think many of us, plenty of us who, who knew Jamal, who also are students of international relations, know that particularly when it comes to the United States, we do have a pretty uh, inglorious track record of doing deals with dictators and human rights abusers. Um, and I think, you know, I think for a lot of us, um, it, it's bigger than that. It's, it was about pushing for a different way to do business with the rest of the world. And it's hard for me to really, uh, to really believe that if Biden hadn't have gone, that somehow the U.S.-Saudi relationship, 100 years of a relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States would have completely fallen apart. Just no, it wouldn't have happened. But in this case, uh, what Biden has done and what the Saudis, uh, you know, now gleefully will have is, is the optics of Mohammed bin Salman responsible for Jamal's murder, responsible for all sorts of other atrocities in, in Yemen. He has given him a chance to uh, to be rehabilitated on the world stage. I just don't believe that that was necessarily something that the United States and Biden needed to do at this juncture. You know, Jothi, um, I'm sure you read the comment from Fred Ryan, the publisher and CEO of the Washington Post, which mirrored much of what uh, uh, Karen wrote. He said the mm -hmm. fist bump between President Biden and Mohammed bin Salman was worse than a handshake. It was shameful. It projected a level of intimacy and comfort that delivers to MBS the unwarranted redemption he has been desperately, desperately seeking. Do you really disagree with them, or is this one of these, yes, uh, what they say is true, However, that's the mm -hmm. sense I get from the New York Times editorial. Am I right? I think that's right. I mean, Karen is exactly correct in pointing out that the um, the problem here is the contrast between candidate Biden mm -hmm. and uh, President Biden, you know, someone who's trying to carry out U.S. foreign policy uh, in the world that he has uh, the world that he's in rather than the world that he might as he might wish that it is. So. And I think that was what we were trying to illuminate um, in our editorial this week is that, 
you know, the, the values-based part of his foreign policy was always going to be the most challenging for him. I mean, he, it seems like is by nature a pragmatist, but what he sort of set his up, set his foreign policy up for was this um, kind of strict binary distinction between good and bad, between democracy and autocracy. And that's just a very, very difficult way to conduct foreign policy. And that's what we've we've seen here for sure. So Jothi, briefly list for me, if you can, what were the major things in your estimation, in your newspaper's editorial, that Biden needed to address in such a meeting? Mm -hmm. I mean, take your pick. There's oil prices. There is, you know, human rights, absolutely. And, and I think it's fair to say that most Americans care about both of those things. Certainly our readers do. And, you know, it's, it's hard for uh, even for voters to understand, like, well, what is it that a president can do to address both of those things um, at the same time. And then, you know, then of course there's the sort of broader picture of the region. Sure. I mean, the the Gulf states, it's, it's interesting. I think there's really been a realignment um, in the region over the last few years. Um, one that frankly was started under the Trump administration. And this is one of the policies that I think the Biden administration has looked at and sort of considered and they have not repudiated everything that the Trump administration did. Um, so again, this is an extreme, you know, it's a, it's a more complicated situation than perhaps even Biden thought that he One would, last uh, thing with you though, Jothi, before we go back to Karen, is it not trouble you that in the piece that Biden himself wrote in the Washington Post, the first thing you mentioned, which would have been the first thing I mentioned, oil, uh, was almost an afterthought. It was a throwaway line at the end of a paragraph as if that had nothing to do with the visit. Mm-hmm. That trouble that was you? surprising. <laughs> well, I don't know if it, I don't know if trouble is exactly the right word. We we certainly noted that okay. as well in our editorial. Um, I think it's very clear that he did not want to be seen to be the you know to have made this visit because of oil prices. But I think it's very clear that that was on the agenda. Karen, you intimated a minute ago, or maybe you said specifically, maybe it didn't have to be at a presidential level. But as the New York Times editorial mentions, a lot of people have mentioned uh, 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 Nixon and China, uh, uh, meetings between Russian and uh, American leaders during the Cold War. It's not aberrational uh, for this country's leaders to meet with, I would even argue, far worse uh, uh, human rights violators. Would, would you not agree? I mean, I think with Saudi Arabia in, in particular, fair, but also technically the head of the country is King Salman. <laughs> he is still alive. And that was a, a attack that the Biden administration yeah. was, was actually using, um, meeting with King Salman and directly addressing King Salman instead of uh, the Saudi crown prince. Uh, but again, I mean, it's, it's obviously, there's plenty to say about America's track record with dealing, again, with dictators. Look at um, Sisi uh, of Egypt, President Sisi of Egypt. Yeah. Um, and putting national security interests ahead of, uh, of human rights. Uh, that being said, I think what is very often missing from these uh, conversations are frankly the people, <laughs> um, the, the people, the dissidents, the critics, um, the, the civil society in these countries who are being uh, completely you know, um, repressed, right? And, and silenced, and part of that is due to the geopolitics of yeah the alignment with uh, the American um, with the American government. Well, so I would have wished I would have wished I could have heard uh, more from Biden about um, the civil society and the people well, can in I, the region. Can I raise another issue that I'm guessing you both uh, would agree? Well, I shouldn't make that assumption, but a, a, a starting with Jamal Khashoggi's murder, uh, there was also a desire on the part of the family of Shireen Abu Akla the Palestinian-American mm -hmm. journalist, to meet with President Biden. She was the one where I think there's a consensus killed by Israeli bullets. Her family and the Palestinian leadership suggest it was intentional. I don't believe we reached that conclusion. It seems uh, to me, Jothi, that we didn't do terribly well on this visit in terms of protecting the security of journalists on any front, did we? Mm -hmm. No, and I think that's exactly it. I, I think that... Um, uh, 
somehow in this visit, those issues just weren't really raised to the extent that they were, that they, they could have been. And I think I would add also um, the families of people who are still um, uh, held hostage in, in, in some of these places. Like, I think they were very disappointed by this yeah. visit. I think there are, you know, many people who were, had reason to be disappointed by this visit. Um, but again, as we pointed out in the editorial, um, sometimes this sort of binary way of looking at the world yeah. isn't necessarily the, the thing that serves the long-term interests of, of people in the region who obviously have many of the same uh, desires that we do to, to sort of live um, with more freedom. Jothi, uh, I mean, uh, Karen, am I going too far when I say that the, the way the deaths of these two journalists was treated is, it? Well, I don't want to say gives an open license for other leaders to do similar uh, atrocious things, but it does minimize the importance of protecting journalists, does it not? Yeah, I don't think you're going too far at all. Um, I think the message that both uh, in the case of, um, of of Israel and Saudi Arabia is that it, it really pays to be a U.S. ally in the region. Um, I think that uh, you know if this were if this were Russia, perhaps I think there would have been a lot of uh, tough talk, tougher talk, right? Um, but these are our allies in in the region, and I think it sends a very chilling message uh, to journalists. Um, around the world, um, and also to U.S. citizens and residents. Jamal was a U.S. resident. Right. Um, Abu Akleh was a U.S. citizen. Yeah. And so, what does this mean that you know our our, our own government um, won't also stand up for journalists who who should have the privileges of U.S. residency and citizenship? Karen, I only have one minute left, and I, I think most people watching know about your former colleague's extraordinary journalism but we didn't know him, and you did. Could you spend a few seconds and tell us a little bit about Jamal as a person? Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, so I, I recruited and, and hired and, and worked with Jamal for, uh, for a year before, um, before he was murdered. And, I mean, he was a gem of a human being, honestly. Um, and... I think what people need to understand is that he wasn't, he loves Saudi Arabia. Um, you can see it in a lot of his pieces. He wasn't out to cause the downfall of, of the regime even. He just had minor criticisms of Mohammed bin Salman. And so it still haunts me that the idea that possibly the work he was doing with us, um, you know, might have led to, to you know, this happening. Um, but, you know, I hope that, I think the most important thing is that the Saudi regime wanted him to just disappear. And as long as, you know, we still talk about him and we still talk about what he represents, more importantly, um, that they haven't succeeded as much as they wanted to. I think you were right. Karen Atiyah mm -hmm. and Jothi Thotham, thank you both so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you.